everyone. My name is Shannon Craddock. I'm the Programs and Accreditations Manager at Perry Johnson Registrars. Welcome to the fourth in a four-part series on the transition to IATF 16949. All participants have been muted to ensure sound quality. If you have a question, I'll answer them at the end of today's prepared presentation. Please type your question into the question feature, and I usually am able to answer all of them at the end of the prepared content section. Um, today's content should be a lot easier than last week's. Last week's we discussed some of the most substantive changes, um, so hopefully we'll get through this with plenty of time to answer questions on anything we've covered in this four-part series. Question we always get relates to the availability of slides and a recording of today's webinar. All, yes, all of that will be available for download from our website, www.pjr.com, within 24 to 48 hours after the broadcast. We left off on Section 861, Release of Products and Services Supplemental. Here we have an enhancement of what was in ISO TS 16949. The intent here is to ensure that process controls align with the control plan. One of the most common findings is that the organization is doing something and it doesn't match the control plan, most likely because the control plan isn't maintained as a living document. Um, to achieve coherence between the control plan and the planned arrangements to verify conformity of the product or service, the organization should conduct a regular control plan audit that compares the current approval status of the product and process with the actual controls applied in the manufacturing process. I can't reiterate the importance of this enough. Um, the most common finding that I find as a third-party auditor is simply walking the control plan and finding out that the activities that the organization is actually doing don't match the control plan. And this is actually something that sh you should be doing as part of your manufacturing process audit anyway. 862, a clarification here in terms of an added note. And this is simply that the annual, um, the layout inspection and functional testing um, needs to be done at a frequency that's determined by the customer. Um, most often this is annual, but you need to make sure you're following the um, customer-specific requirements here. Eight six three appearance items. Um, the addition here um, relates to the provision of masters for haptic technology. That's really the only um, significant change here. 864, verification and acceptance of conformity and externally provided products and services. 8, 6, 4, the change in, the, is in this section were made to ensure conformity with ISO 9001 2015 terminology and clarify the source of statistical data is that provided by the supplier to the organization. So it says receipt and evaluation of statistical data provided by the supplier to the organization. There's our change. 865 is a section on statutory and regulatory conformity. Prior to release of externally provided products into its production flow, the organization shall confirm and be able to provide evidence that externally provided products, processes, services conform to the latest statutory regulatory requirements. Um, and this has to consider countries where products are manufactured, as well as the destination countries, um, if, if known. 866, acceptance criteria. Mm -hmm. 
really a carry over here, um, a clarification of where required to be, where appropriate or required, and then updates the clause reference to align with the new structure. No major changes in content or intent here. Okay, some changes here um, with customer authorization for concession. Um, the changes are for alignment of terminology and the clarification of concessions applied to rework of non-conforming product and subcomponent reuse. The organization has to obtain customer authorization prior to further processing for use as is and rework disposition of non-conforming products and subcomponent reuse must be clearly communicated to the customer. Appropriate internal verification and validation activities of any rework or reuse of subcomponents should be approved prior to customer submission. The changes related to recording an expiration date or the quantity authorized and clearly identifying on shipping containers, um, products shipped under concession, all of that remains the same. Eight seven one two. The section control of non-conforming product customer specified process ensures that customer controlled shipping requirements are followed, and that these customer specified requirements are integrated in the organization's own internal process. Eight seven one three suspect product um, the updates in this section augment the requirements for control of suspect product by ensuring containment training is implemented. The organization shall ensure that all appropriate manufacturing personnel receive training for containment of suspect and non-conforming product. This training should consider awareness of special characteristics, customer specified requirements related to non-conforming product control, product safety, the escalation process, appropriate storage areas, and related roles. Eight seven one four control of reworked product. The scope of control of rework product requirements include customer approval, risk assessment, rework confirmation, traceability, and the retention of documented information. Keep in mind that the risk analysis and customer approval requirements are interrelated. That your FEMA should identify and address risks related to each possible rework of the characteristics stated in the control plan. 8715, control of repaired product. Very similar to rework product, again, the organization has to utilize a risk analysis to assess risks in the repair process prior to the decision to repair product. There needs to be a documented process for repair confirmation instructions for disassembly or repair. The organization shall obtain documented customer authorization for concession and retain documented information on the disposition of repaired product, including quantity disposition, disposition date, and traceability information. 8716 is a new section stemming from some 9001 requirements and the need to address customer issues for IETF OEM concerns. The organization is required to immediately notify the customer if they ship non-conforming product and follow up with detailed documentation of the event. Eight seven one seven. Interesting section: non-conforming product disposition. The organization has to have a documented process for how they're going to handle product that cannot be repaired or reworked. 
products. Um, so if we have a product that simply does not meet requirements, the organization has to verify that the product to be scrapped is rendered unusable prior to disposal. Um, at least in the aerospace industry, this means that it's rendered permanently unusable. So simply spray painting something red um, to identify scrap product is not something to render it unusable. The organization shall not divert non-conforming product to service or other use without prior customer approval. Okay, moving on to Section 9. The organization shall perform process studies on all new manufacturing processes to verify process capability and to provide additional input for process control, including those for special characteristics. This includes assembly or sequencing processes. The organization has to maintain manufacturing process capability or performance results as specified by the customer's part approval process requirements. The organization has to verify that the process flow, PFEMA, and control plan are implemented and ensure that measuring techniques, sampling plans, acceptance criteria, records of actual measurement values or test results, and reaction plans and escalation processes are adhered to when acceptable criteria aren't met. Significant process events such as tool change or, ma or machine repair still need to be recorded. Initiation of a reaction plan is still a requirement. There is an added note that for some manufacturing processes it may not be possible to demonstrate product compliance through process capability. Um, alternate methods such as batch conformance to a spec may be used depends again on the type of product you're making. 9112, the organization has to identify the appropriate statistical tools to be used. And the tool chosen in um, the APQP or equivalent process um, must be included in your risk analysis and documented on the control plan. Not much new there. Not much new with 9113 application of statistical concepts. Um, there is a clarification regarding requirements for those involved in capturing and analyzing data. Um, previously, this was driven across all employees regardless of relevance. Um, so it relates to employees involved in the collection, analysis, and management of statistical data. So if you have an employee that may not be involved in collecting or determining if a process is uh, stable, capable, in control, they may not need to understand some of these concepts. Nine one two one customer satisfaction supplemental. Here there's been a clarification on customer satisfaction monitoring criteria. Um, the criteria should include but not be limited to the following delivered part quality performance, customer disruptions, field returns, recalls, and warranty. Warranties new there. Delivery schedule performance, including instances of premium freight, and customer notifications relating to quality or delivery issues, including special status. The organization has a responsibility to access, review, and take appropriate action about information published in customer portals. We've seen this come up before with clearly identifying and documenting who in the organization is going to access the various customer portals. In fact, IETF auditors as well as TS auditors will document a major if the organization can't access the customer portal. 
And when identifying the need for correction or improvement actions, any scorecard deficiency should be given priority. Nine one three one prioritization. Um, TS one six nine four nine called this analysis of data. Here, there's uh, an increased emphasis on the prioritization of actions based on performance and risk management. Actions to improve customer satisfaction need to take precedence as the organization considers trends and drives towards improvement. So obviously there's always a finite amount of resources to go around when we, when we look at improving as an organization. So there needs to be a prioritization of those actions that will improve on time, on quality performance in the eyes of your customers. 9221, um, some significant changes related to the internal audit program. Um, there's been a strengthening here and an emphasis on driving a risk-based approach to the program and the deployment of an organization-wide internal audit program. We need to think of the internal audit program as a process, so we need to clearly identify inputs, planned activities, outputs, and monitor those and, make, and take actions as a result of that monitoring. If an organization is responsible for software development, the organization shall include software development capability assessments in their internal audit program. Same as if you would monitor these if they were an outsourced process. Similar to 822 and ISO TS16949, you need to adjust the frequency of your internal audits um, based on internal or external nonconformities or customer complaints. The effectiveness of the internal audit program needs to be reviewed as part of management review. Looking now specifically at the three different types of audits, 922, Two talks about the quality management system audit. All quality management system processes need to be audited over each three-year calendar period according to an annual program using the process approach. Okay, so what this means is that it is possible to look at all processes over a three-year period as opposed to annually. However, so for those processes looked at in a given year, there needs to be an annual schedule. So not every process needs to be looked at every year, but there needs to be at least an annual schedule of what you're going to look at. Again, we're doing process-based audits, so customer-specific requirements shall be integrated within the organization's process, and that matrix that you're required to keep is part of, I believe, 7511. Um, indicating where the organization's quality management system, where in that your customer-specific requirements are addressed. That document is going to help to ensure that customer-specific requirements are integrated in your, your quality management system process-based audit. 9223 talks about manufacturing process audits. Each manufacturing process audit has to be audited over a three-year calendar period to determine effectiveness and efficiency. When you're auditing a particular process, you need to look at it at all, on all shifts. And you also need to be looking at shift handover or crossover, whatever it is that you're calling that. The audit needs to include an audit of the effective implementation of the risk analysis, control plan, and associated documents. One of the biggest failures I see in a manufacturing process audit is the team doing the manufacturing process audit goes out and they don't have a copy of the control plan in FEMA. Those are the, the, the key inputs you need to make sure the manufacturing process audit is successful. Um, obviously, you want to adjust this three-year schedule um, if there are customer complaints or issues um, relative to a particular manufacturing process. Product audit. 
um, you need to use a customer specified approach where applicable. And if there isn't a customer specified approach, you need to define your own process. Nine three one one management review supplemental. Management review needs to be conducted annually. Um, you would adjust the frequency of management review based on risk to compliance with customer requirements or internal or external changes impacting your QMS or any performance related issues. The one year frequency is a minimum. Management review input supplemental. Um, so there's been some additions to the management review inputs. The list now goes A through K. Includes cost of poor quality, measures of process effectiveness and process efficiency, product conformance, assessments of manufacturing feasibility made for changes to existing operations and for new facilities or new product, customer satisfaction, review of performance against maintenance objectives, warranty, customer scorecards, potential field failures, and actual field failures. Management review output supplemental. Top management needs to document and implement an action plan when customer performance targets are not met. The intent here is that even though process owners should address customer performance issues related to the, process the processes that they manage as they occur, this requirement gives top management the clear and ultimate responsibility to address customer performance issues and ensure the effectiveness of corrective actions. So again, this discussion and management review ensures that top management is involved in these issues. Okay, moving on to 10 2, 3, problem solving. Updates to this section um, were made to facilitate, facilitate the consolidation of IETF OEM customer specific requirements regarding problem solving. So there needs to be a documented process for problem solving. So there's a requirement for a procedure um, the organization's defined process for problem solving must consider diff different approaches for various types and scales of problems. Um, implementing containment interim actions and related activities to control the non-conforming outputs. Um, implementation of some type of root cause analysis process. Um, methodology used, analysis and results. Implementation of systemic corrective actions including the concept of corrective action impact, verification of the effectiveness of implemented corrective actions, and reviewing and, where necessary, updating appropriate documented information, updating your control plan in FEMA to take credit for the actions taken, and ensuring that those documents are maintained as the living documents that they are. Um, if the customer has specified tools or techniques, um, for problem solving, the organization shall use said tools and techniques. Ten two four is a section on error proofing. Organization has to have a defined, a documented process to determine the use of appropriate error proofing methodologies. The air proofing methodology used needs to be documented in the FEMA or your risk analysis, whatever form that takes. And the test frequencies for validating the effectiveness of the air proofing technique has to be documented in the control plan. And this is something that's often missing. Um, your documented process needs to include the testing of error-proofing devices for failure or simulated failure. Records shall be maintained. Challenged parts, if you're using them, have to be identified, controlled, verified, and calibrated where feasible. Um, An error-proofing device failure shall have a reaction plan. And this ties into the backup method, um, 85611, temporary change of process controls.
warranty management systems. This is a new requirement based on increasing importance of warranty management and consolidates IETF OEM customer specific requirements. Organizations required to implement a warranty management process and included in this process shall be a method for warranty part analysis including no trouble found. And where specified by the customer, the organization shall implement the required warranty management process. Ten two six, customer complaints and field failure test analysis. Um, the new requirement here is related to embedded software and identification of preferred approaches. Where requested by the customer, this shall include analysis of the interaction of the embedded software of the organization's product within the system of the final customer's product. The organization shall communicate the results of testing analysis to the customer and also within the organization. And finally, 10.3.1, Continual Improvement Supplemental, um, a requirement for a documented process for continual improvement. This, there wasn't a requirement for a documented process prior to this. Included in this process shall be an identification of the methodology used, um, objectives, measurement, effectiveness, and documented information that's retained, a manufacturing process improvement action plan with emphasis on the reduction of process variation and waste, and use of risk analysis tools such as FEMA. The note that was in TS16949 about continual improvement only being, process, only being possible once manufacturing processes are st statistically capable and stable and product characteristics are predictable and meet customer requirements is still a note. So we talked about a lot of changes in the new automotive QMS IETF 16949, um, the intent of which are to increase the value and credibility of certification, a lot of emphasis on risk and top management involvement. Um, many customer specific requirements have been integrated into IETF 16949, um, hence one of the reasons in 7511 to create that matrix. And that concludes today's prepared presentation on the content changes in IETF 16949. I'll now open the floor for any questions that you may have on anything that's been discussed in these four webinars. Getting lots of questions about obtaining the webinar slides. Again, these will be available for download from www.pjr.com along with an audio recording within 24 to 48 hours. Good question about defining measures of process efficiency. What are some examples of those measures? Um, one of the most common measures of process efficiency might be an OEE measure. Um, a lot of measures are centered on effectiveness. I think one of the most common ones would be OEE.
You might also be able to argue that um, first time through measures, um, first time acceptability related objectives could be argued as measures of process efficiency. Wait a few minutes to see if there's any other questions coming in. And if you have questions, type them into the question feature, not in a position if you're raising your hand to, to give you audio control on this particular webinar. Getting some questions about the deadline. Um, I'm assuming that means the deadline for transition. Um, all audits after the 1st of October 2017 have to be to IETF 16949. Um, so if, you're, if your organization's normal audit anniversary due date is in November of a calendar year, you would have to transition this year. Um, all ISO TS 16949 certificates are invalid as of September 14th, 2018, which is the obsolescence date of TS 16949. Um, however, if you have an audit in July, um, you still will get the full um, 60 days for corrective action. CB will still get the 30 days to approve your corrective actions, and Veto Power will get another 30 days to make a certification decision. Um, that timing hasn't changed. So if you're transitioning late in the, uh, the period, so probably from maybe May, June, July on, um, there, is a, there is a chance that your certificate may lapse. Um, which may or may not be okay with your customers. So we're encouraging all clients to get their annual and transition audits scheduled. Um, again, all transition audits are equivalent in duration to a recertification. So if you can make your transition audit coincide with your normal recertification audit, that is ideal. Randy, you may want to clarify your question. I'm not sure I'm understanding it. Should your work instruction re refer to specific standards in the section numbers like Section 8513, Verification of Job Setups? No, there's no requirement that your work instructions need to tie back to the TS-169, I'm sorry, the IETF-16949 requirements. Obviously, your work instructions need to meet all the requirements of the standard. Um, a new requirement for work instructions is um, discussing uh, product safety, employee safety in them. Um, so that, that's a change, but you don't necessarily have to reference the standard clause number relating to that.
wait a few more minutes to see if we get any other questions come in. Getting a question about traceability, Section 8521. So, uh, Section 8521 speaks about traceability plans. Could you provide an example of such a plan? Um, so looking, going back and looking at the requirement, the organization shall conduct an analysis of internal customer and regulatory traceability requirements for all automotive products including developing and documenting traceability plans based on the level of risk or f failure severity for employees, customers, and consumers. Um, a plan can take many different forms. It could be a, a procedure or a process flow. Um, the uh, Lots of intent here. Um, you you want to make sure that you accomplish a number of things. Um, you want to ensure that the product is traceable in case um, there's non-conforming or suspect product that you can identify where your, your clear stop and start points are. Um, some customers may require individual serialization of products. Um, maybe if you're doing instrument panel assembly, for example, each of those have to be individually serialized. Um, how, how those are traced, so that's not necessarily a non-conforming situation. So the plans may take many different formats. Um, they may be reaction plans if things go wrong, or they may be part of the defined manufacturing process in the case of individual serialization. I hope that addresses the question. Lilia, please um, let me know if you need additional clarification. Wait a few more minutes to see if we get any additional questions. Again, folks, I'm happy to field any questions you have on the transition timing, the duration of the audits, um, if you're not sure when you should be transitioning, or um, some of the initial steps you should be taking if you haven't gotten, gotten started yet. Wait just a few more minutes to see if we have any additional questions coming in. Again, folks, you'll need to buy a copy of both ITF 16949 and ISO 9001. 
and implement both sets of requirements in order to claim certification to IETF 16949. Your certificate will simply state IETF 16949 2016. We covered that on the first webinar. Important point though I think to note. If you want a separate ISO 9001 certificate for your non-automotive manufacturing, remember non-automotive manufacturing is not included in the scope of an automotive audit. We'll be adding time to assess non-automotive manufacturing to give you a separate ISO 9001 certificate for that type of manufacturing. Okay, folks, it appears that's all the questions that we have today. I thank you for your valuable time, and I hope you found this four-part webinar series helpful. If you've missed anything, you can always um, listen to a recording and download the slides from www.pjr.com. Thank you, and have a great day.